Thank you guys. Tremendous. The title of today's message is Right or Left. So uh, I'm going to assume, I'm not going to assume everybody knows where these right and left terms come from, at least in our uh, political arena. A little more light in the room, speaking of light, if we could do that just up here. Um, right or left. So if you walk into the Congress of the United States, everything to your left, you go down that aisle, there's a center aisle, everything to your left is left, everything to your right is right. Conservative, liberal, they literally separate out the room. And so when you talk about people being way to the right, conservative, whatever, or way to the left, liberal, whatever that is, that's where we get that. So where should a Christian be? If you walked in the room, if you walked in the, in the Congress, you're visiting the building, where would you sit? If you, they said, pick a spot based on who you are. Where would you find yourself in the room? Would you be way over by the wall on the left or way over on the wall by the right? Or would you just kind of stand in the aisle? You say, well, these things shouldn't be discussed in church. So let me talk to you about that for a second. The First Amendment does not try to keep the government, keep the church so much out of government as government out of the church. Right? That thing was passed to say, you leave us alone. Okay? But people turn that around and say, well, we can't have an impact on government. But if we can have an impact on government, what kind of impact can we have? You say, well, I feel very strongly about your issue, wherever that issue is. Maybe it's on immigration, maybe it's on the economy, maybe it's on welfare or not, government control or not. You got some issue, you're hot on that issue. I got my issue, right? So anybody that knows me for any period of time knows that from a civic standpoint, as a person in a republic, a democracy where we can vote, I have an issue that I get hot, it's, I'm hot on. I'm a one-issue voter till that one issue is no longer an issue. You hear me say that, right? And some people clap about that. And some people use other forms of their hand to tell me how they feel. So... Um, so I don't, I, I don't get upset. I don't hate you if you disagree with me, right? I don't have anything personal against you if you disagree with me. That's just where I am. And you say, well, what's that issue? It's abortion. I just really don't see how any nation in the world can kill 60-something plus million unborn children and last very long. I just don't get it, right? Now, you say, well, but you keep, you keep going after that as though something's going to change. Well, here's what I really know about that issue. I know that if somehow I vote a certain way and certain people put certain judges and let's say a Supreme Court case gets overturned, that really that doesn't stop the killing. All that does is push it back to the states. You say, well, then what's your point? Why, why, why do you keep pushing? Because if you can do something to stop unborn children, and it's one of the most dangerous places in our country is in a woman's womb, unfortunately, you, you know, they, they don't know it, but you may or may not get out alive. What you think, you just be, everybody get out alive. So even if it all, you change all the laws, you vote a certain way, change all that, um, will the killing stop? Probably not. In the same way that murder of living people outside of the womb is illegal, and we still have that, but you'd think you'd want to slow that down too, right? So you say, well, why do you fight for these things? Why do you even verbalize these things? Um, because it's worth saying. But if you follow me around and listen to me speak long enough, there's, you may hear me mention that, but what do you hear me speak of more than anything? Jesus. Okay? So here's kind of where we're going today. Whether you're right or left, wherever you pick, you would sit in that assembly and say, this is where I identify. Let me say this slowly and carefully. You better not be more hot about your issue than you are Jesus, or we're all in trouble. 
You can't find one instance, for instance, of civil disobedience, go, go do this as a Christian. And until recently in our world, United States, some, a, few, a few places around the world, you couldn't even pick your leader. So let's read some scriptures and I'll, I'll duck behind these. So Daniel chapter 2. Uh, and I'm just going to go through, this isn't an exhaustive list, it's just uh, a few of these to kind of cover. Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. Speaking of God, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So, and I can read you a verse in, uh, in the New Testament about this as well. So this is a little perplexing, even for me, to get my head around. The people in the world, even in North Korea, at any given time, the guy running North Korea is not there because he picked to be there. God put him there. You say, well, why would God put that guy there? I don't know, but that's what the book says. You say, well, what's his purpose? What's his plan? I don't know. But you don't get to be king, president, anything without God knowing it and it happening on his watch. So you say, well, that guy's a pig. That guy's a monster. That guy's a whatever. Whatever you can come up with, I got more verses for you where the scripture says to honor the king or whoever the person is in authority. Well, I can't do that. Then you're going to have a hard time reading the Bible and living a Christian life. See, if you, if you stop honoring people you don't like, you're going to shoot your parents probably. Bible says, you know, honor your father and mother. It says to obey him as a child, but when you get, you're, you're not, I'm not a child anymore. It says to honor him. Are you doing that or not? You either are or you aren't. Well, I don't like them. They were evil. They were mean. That's not what it says. It says to honor him. Find some way to honor him. Daniel chapter 4, verse 17. The decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know, so this is what they need to know, that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever he will, and sets over it the lowest of men. So sometimes God will reach down and pick somebody up, and you're like, who is this person? Not a prominent person, not a wealthy person, not anything. Just kind of reaches out and you go, well, if he's going to pick a nobody, you should have done a better job. Why, why'd you pick this nobody? Now, how this works in, in our country is very perplexing to me. Because we have elections and people go into, you know, either you do it at the house and mail it in or you walk into a gym where I did it and, you know, you mark some things on a page and it goes in and all of a sudden millions, tens of millions of people pick a leader. You say, God didn't pick that person. I did. We did. Only God can change a heart. And this is going to be very bizarre to even say out loud for some of you. You say, well, I'm going to do what I want to do. There are times when God puts something in your head and in your heart to do that you were not going to do. You say, well, I know who I am. I know where I'd sit in the assembly, left or right, and this is who I am. So let me say this before I forget to say this. You should do nothing. I should not be a one-issue voter. You should do nothing politically anywhere without asking God if that's what he wants you to do. Well, I'm going to go in there and vote for this person. Before you do it, left, right, whoever you are, you need to stop and say, Lord, what is your will for my life in this situation? Now, if you really want to do some homework, I do recommend going to both people, both parties, whatever party you vote for, and, and read their platform. It's, it's something usually on their website, and it'll lay out everything that they're about and that they want to do. And if you can read all that and find scripture and say, you know what, this seems to line up, this is why I'm going to pick this party. Or you read it one of those and you go, oh, I don't like this. Or I do agree with it, left or right, but I don't like the person. Let me tell you something about persons. They come and go. And in our system, we got it set up, thank God, where they come and go. And you say, well, who were you thinking about when you said that? I don't know. Who were you thinking about? 
Because there's a good chance we all got somebody different that we were glad to see him go. But we still have a country, and the system works, and no matter how powerful someone thinks they are, God picks. I can't explain to you how he does it, but I believe it still happens. That no one becomes president of the United States without the permission of God. Now that'll mess you up. One more, Daniel chapter 4. Let's do uh, 32. Um, end there of 32. They shall make you, uh, this is talking about Nebuchadnezzar, they shall make you, make you eat grass and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. So Nebuchadnezzar was king and God turned him to an animal that just grazed out there like a, like a cow, an ox, and long nails, hair, like what happened to him? God said, you messed with the wrong God. I'm the only God. And here's what you're going to get. And then he came out of that. Look at uh, Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. Nebuchadnezzar, this is after he came out of it. Lift, Nebuchadnezzar lifted my eyes to heaven. Uh, at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? So who runs the planet? You say, well, the devil's got some authority. The devil can't do anything without God's permission. So you say, well, I don't like a certain whatever. Then do what you can. You say, well, I have a voice. I, I have a vote. Go vote. All I'm saying to you is pray about your vote. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this person out of there. Is that really your motivation? So you get that person out. What if another one steps in? And another one. And another one. Ask him how he would like to vote based on what is being presented. Not just the people, but the platforms, the policies, whatever. Now you say, well, I got verses to back up whatever I got. Look, uh, pe people say, well, you should get up. I get these texts sometimes. You know, you should get up and tell them how they should vote. That's not my job. My job is to hook you up with the Father through Jesus, his Son, indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and get you communicating with him because I'm not going to be around all the time. So you've got to figure out a way to operate where you live every day of your life and communicate with him. And, and it's not about, well, what do I want? That's not even the point. You say, Lord, what do you want? Your will be done. Not my will, your will be done. What would you do? What do you want to do in this situation? You live in me, now live through me. And you go, well, my head's going to spin off because he's going to get me to do this and I was going to do that. Obey. See, you find, these are the places we find out who we really are. People that can open their wallet and say, well, hold on a minute, you know. You know, I got a card in here somewhere. And they pull out their card and go, see there, I'm a Christian. If you got to pull a card, it ain't working. <laughs> you either are or you aren't. You're living it or you're not. Now, I'll tell you something else personally. Um, I, get, I get animated. I get excited. I go to bat about things about abortion. You don't see me angry, right? I'm not angry. I'm sad. I'm upset. It's heartbreaking. I don't get it. I, I live in a country where this goes on, but I'm not going around to find somebody that disagrees with me and you're going to hell. That's where you're going. For what? For disagreeing with me? You're not going to hell for disagreeing with me. You'll go to hell for, for denying Jesus, right? But not political stuff. So everybody just chill back off and figure out what are you ang so angry about on whatever your issue is and say, Lord, what do you want me to be and what do you want me to do? And just obey, do that. Matthew chapter 5. Have the numbers dropped on the broadcast yet? Let's see if they brought it. There's usually a point where like, boom, they're gone. I'm like, okay, it's all right. 
hanging there won't be all bad at the end. <laughs> um, sometimes people turn things off they don't want to hear because they don't want to hear them. And they don't want anybody challenging who they are and where they are. They don't want to think about it. I'm not even going to consider an alternative. And then you wake up 20, 30 years and go, wow, why was I so stiff-necked and this didn't work out very well? Matthew chapter 5, ble uh, verse 11. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you. Okay, so you say, oh, now we're talking about this is my stuff. They, they persecuted me. And say all kinds of evil against you falsely. And then you got to add two words. For my sake. That is not for your sake. If you're out there being an idiot and you get persecuted, that ain't the reason. The reason he's saying you should be blessed is what? You are persecuted, they're saying evil against you falsely for his sake, which means what? You're out there living the Christian life and everybody knows that's who you are, what you're about, and they persecute you for that. Keep reading. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to throw out and trampled underfoot by men. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. So you say, oh, I got good works. But if it's really working, this is the end of it. And glorify your Father in heaven. So what are we doing down here? You say, well, I'm going to be an activist for something. I don't, I don't mind people taking a stand. If you want to activate something, activate your Christianity. Right? Be known for someone who lives it, who loves him. You're not going around wagging fingers angry. You are salt. You are light. You know what you're here to do. That's why I am still on the planet. So people say, well, he's all excited about whatever. They need to know that you're excited about Jesus and following him, whatever the cost, persecution, and even if persecution comes, what? Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Oh my gosh, I finally reached a level where I'm being persecuted for nothing else but, but speaking his name. And usually we go, oh, I feel so bad. They're mean to me. And the Bible is replete with that verses where people are pumped. Where finally my life, they see my good works. Either they persecute me, but if it's going well, they glorify my Father in heaven. Um, you know something's working with children. When people meet children and start making comments about the parents. Now think about that. Wow, who are those kids? Man, well behaved. I'd, I'd love to meet their dad, their mom. Like, well, where are these kids? Who are these kids, right? You start looking for the source of whatever this is because you know it's just not random. So this should be going on with us. Someone meets you, meets me, is around me and like, wow, what in the world? Who is this person? I wonder who his dad is. I wonder who his father is. And then they start talking about him because of the difference he's made in me and in you. So I'll give you, if you're still listening beyond here and in the room, you say, well, now I'm still upset with him about the abortion thing. Why are you upset with me? Why well, disagree? Okay, I bet we got other things we could disagree on thing. Are you going to hate me about that? Well, you're wrong and I'm right. Okay. If you're a believer and I'm a believer, the way I read the book, we're going to be forever together. So how, how, how is that going to work down here where believers are hating on each other for disagreeing about things? Right? Is that what this is? Is this is what it's turned into? I'm not talking about political stuff. I'm not talking about the world. I'm just talking about the church. We've lost our minds. Attacking people, hating people, canceling people, unfriending people. Like, what are you doing over stuff? And instead of praying for them and reaching out to them and is there something, you know, what's going on? How'd you arrive at that? Let's talk. Matthew chapter 25. 
So let me go back one more time to abortion. So here's what's interesting to me. What I've figured out in all my passion about that is if, you're, if the Supreme Court reverses the decision, it goes to the states, their state's already locked down and, and passing laws so that they can kill a child after it's born if that's what they want to do because they're terrified that the law is going to be reversed in the Supreme Court. So they're prepared to continue the killing. I'm like, whoa. So how do you change that? It's the way you change any and everything on the planet. Until an individual heart is changed, a nation is never going to be changed. Right? So you say, God, heal our land. Well, our land, even land, is made up of pieces of dirt. Right? So if you really believe that God can change whatever your issue is, then you have to start with the only place that can bring about change. I also, and people think I'm nuts about this, so... I guess I'll see you on this one too. You know, I'm not a fan of gay marriage. It ain't in there. You say, well, we got laws. I really don't care. I get you have a law, you can go get married. It's not in there. You say, well, you're nuts. You're behind the times. My book don't change. Your book may change. My book doesn't change. You say, well, why would you even mention something like gay marriage? Because I have a feeling that could be reversed. How could it be reversed? Lots of hearts would have to change and say, oh, God, have mercy on us. What have we done? We've tried to redefine marriage. We're killing babies. We've lost our minds. And then there's revival, there's repentance, and then laws gets changed. You're like, wow, how'd that happen? It didn't happen without Jesus, I can tell you that. So why do we keep preaching Jesus and him crucified, buried, raised from the dead? Because that's what changes people's lives. I met with a kid the other day, shows up. A friend, so he's 21, a friend of his brought him and his girlfriend, they wanted to meet, we get to the office. He, not a believer in high school, his grandfather had died and was a very sick, very painful situation and he just like kind of, I'm out. If this is what God is and I'm an atheist. Well then recently two, friend, two girls that were friends of his died and so what happened? He's going to these funerals. They're young. He's young. And he's scared. And he comes to meet with me. And within 20 minutes, he's a Christian. He said, well, how'd that happen? Because God was drawing him to himself. And he knew that being an atheist wasn't going to get him anywhere. And, and honestly, if, if you hear knocking on the door... And you sense that God himself, you can't explain it either way, but somebody is kind of calling your name and reaching out to you and wooing you to himself. And you go, la, 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 like they, you don't hear him. You can only la, 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 la so long before you cannot deny that God is after you and cares about you and loves you. And this guy was so ready and prayed, went from darkness to light, from the power of Satan, to the power of God, from death to life, all that stuff. Bam, bam. Whole life changed. I said, call your mom. Listen on speaker. And she was just totally overwhelmed. I've waited for this. And, and throughout, your sins are washed away. I was like, wow, who's she? You don't just, you don't just say that. So who's the answer? It's Jesus. That's ultimately the only hope. So am I passionate about social things? Sure. But without Jesus, you're not going to change any of that. Only thing to change a racist heart is Jesus. You, you can pass all. We got plenty of laws. If, if you can't, you, there's enough laws right now if you enforce them. You can't make a racist person not racist. Only God can change a man's heart, a woman's heart. Oh, but we're going to get them. No, you're not. What are you going to do to them if you get them? Oh, we're going to shut them up. Oh, really? How are we going to do that? We're going to stop them. The world works from the outside in, and God works from the inside out. Okay? Okay. Matthew 25. Uh, so verse 31, let's go down there. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, he will sit on the throne of his glory. 
Now, there are people that believe this is at the end of the tribulation. If you go read the book of Revelation, end of the book of tribulation, end of tribulation, the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ. So, Son of Man comes in all his glory, all the holy angels with him. Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from the other, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set sheep on his right hand but on, and the goats on the left. Now you say, oh, there, I, see where you're, I see what you did there. I see what you did there. <laughs> left, goats, hell. And that's not what I did there. I'm just reading you a story. Okay, so don't be jumping there. Oh, I'm out now for sure. I'm ahead of you. I've already thought about this. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Now that's a very important thing that he's saying here because there are people that will read what I'm about to read you and go, See, it's all about works. No. It, what, these are people that are doing the right thing that are believers, and that had been decided. He knew they were believers before the foundation of the world. So this is not they did good, and that's what got them saved. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. And I was sick and you visited me. I was in poor and you came to me. Um, and by the way, these categories, there are a lot of people say, and that's why we need government. No. The reason we need government is so we don't kill each other and have laws where there's law and order. This is the church's job. Well, we need more welfare. No, we need more Christians to do what they were put here and left here to do. Right? Well, no, I pay taxes for them to do that. And that's how you treat church. Oh, I gave some money so the preacher can lead all those people to Jesus and then I don't have to. Really? You got a verse for that? See, I don't have to do that. He's the expert. We'll, do, we'll let him do all that. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, like, and these are the people who did the right thing. Lord, when did we see you hungry? I mean, we didn't see you. When did we see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison or, or, and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did, we, when did we see you? Like if we had seen you, when did we see you hungry and thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison or, and, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So what does that demonstrate? The book of James talks about this. You say, I have faith. You say, I'm a Christian. And God has the right to say, and the world has the right to say, okay, I saw your card. Let's see your life. And if you say that you're a Christian, you say you're a follower of Christ, and you don't have time for any of the least of these, there's something gone terribly wrong. And in this case, it's going to be like live bullets, real-time problem. Because the people who knew who Jesus was and got it were actively living it out and engaging. Not, and you say, well, I could do all those things without Jesus. Yes, but that's not going to work out for you either. The point here is that when you meet Jesus, he causes you to see himself in the least of these. I go into prisons from time to time, and I say this to the people that I go with. I hate it, because the people in there don't even want to be there. Why do I want to go into a prison all day Saturday and see a bunch of guys who may or may not have done something to end up there? It's a terrible situation. Why do I go into prisons? It's in the book. 
right? So I get in there and I go, oh, this is terrible. It's like, I, you know, I got, I, it's uncomfortable. And then I meet somebody. And you say, well, who'd you meet? Jesus. And you go, wow, sure I'm glad I came to prison today. I might have missed Jesus. And most of us are spending our lives trying to do everything. Now think about this. If you just read that little list that he used right there, what are most of us doing? Trying to avoid those people and those situations. It's all about that. Naked person, not my problem. Change the channel quick. People in need, where's the remote? Ah, I don't want to see that. I'd have to do something about that. Okay. Acts chapter 4. Okay, so this is, just, this, I'm reading you this just because it's very practical. Okay, so um, let's say you go protest for some purpose and you get arrested, some social thing you're about, and you get arrested. That is not being persecuted for righteousness sake. I hate to tell you, you can't, you can't mark it in your book and go two to zero, me, right? That's not how it works. You wanna get yourself arrested for preaching the gospel and doing what God told you to do because you're not gonna back down. Now you're bringing it. But nobody's got any interest in that usually. So read Acts 4, verse 1 with me. Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them, and they put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, so they, they lock them up. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000, a decent day. I preached, 5,000 people got saved, I got arrested, not so good. I'll, I may get out, maybe not, but good day, 5,000, I'll take it. And it came to pass on the next day that the rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, uh, as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at, at Jerusalem. So they're all in town. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by, me, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before uh, stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by, by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Amen. Now, I don't know. I, I got, I'm trying to go easy and I'm trying, I don't want to be mean. Well, we prayed at lunch the other day and people saw us. We held hands. Okay, I'm not knocking your prayer. You got to step this up. Right? We pray at meals and we could be persecuted. What are they going to pour? Lemonade on you? My gosh, what do, what, what do you think is going on? Do something already. Talk to the waiter, the waitress. How are you doing today? What's going on with you? Is there anything we, we're about, we were going to pray, thank God for our food, but is there anything we can pray for you about your life, your family? I've asked this a few times, and you know what? They, all, they come back with something. My mom's really sick. I've had people burst into tears. I even say, hey, well, let's hold hands and, and bring them in. And then they leave going, oh, my gosh. Somebody asked me. Somebody prayed for me. Some people don't have his number. I'm telling you. The reason they want you praying for them is they do not know how to get through. Uh, briefly, I called Diane Feinstein's office the other day. 
I had to dial her number 36 times, got put on hold. Diane Feinstein's little voicemail said, sorry, couldn't get through. She's really nice. And if nobody picks up within two minutes, it's going to disconnect. You have to call back. I said, I'll call back. Boom, I'm dialing that number, dialing that number. Finally, somebody answers. And this is all I said. I'm a pastor in Dallas, Texas. And I said, I just called to say thank you to Senator Feinstein for her civility. And the lady said, okay. I said, okay, thank you. And I hung up. Now, you think she's going to get that message? I don't know. But I knew I was supposed to try. And I knew I wasn't supposed to give up on the first dial. You keep, you keep calling. You keep trying. You keep engaging. You don't back down. So you say, well, I made an attempt. And, this, and the waitress said, it's none of your business what's going on in my life. Okay, try again the next time. Don't give up. Do something. Stretch it a little bit. Verse 13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. I don't care how educated you are. I don't care where you're from. When you've been with Jesus, you come out like this, bold. And people know this is not just religion. This is not just ceremonial. This is a changed person who has been engaged by God himself and is now engaging, allowing Jesus to engage the world through them. That's a whole other thing. How often do you meet this person? Secondly, are you this person? And if not, why not? Verse 14. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? So get them out of here and let's talk about it. What are we going to do to these guys? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So we got to stop these people. Now, you say, well, where does, where does re religion, and this is Jewish people trying to shut down Christians. They had certain legal rights. But if the government walks in here and says, no more in Jesus' name, you know what I'm going to say? Good luck. Because we got no other name. Well, we're going to lock you up. Lock us up. Now you say, well, you say that casually like going to jail would be a simple thing. How are you going to sleep in your bed having denied Jesus? So you get to go home that night and you're going to lay there and think what? I just backed off of the man who died on a cross for me, was buried and raised from the dead, and I can't speak his name no matter what the cost. Now that day may be coming. I don't know if that day's coming. If it comes, you're going to find out who you are and whose you are. And I am trying to stay, you know, keep the temperature up without that necessarily per persecution. You say, well, dude, you say crazy things. People aren't going to come back. I'm not trying to get you to come back. I'm trying to get you to come and go out and be who you're supposed to be and help us all figure out what this is really about. Because if the day comes in this country, and if you read throughout, throughout history, a godless government will try to silence Christians because we are a problem. And worse than that, the Antichrist or the spirit of Antichrist in the world at all times is out to shut us up. Because we have the answer. We are the answer. Salt, light. We got it. They got to get us. They got to shut us down. And this is going on all over the world right now. Go to Belarus right now. They're trying to silence Christians. China, you name it. Okay? Keep reading. Do not speak in this name. No more Jesus. <laughs> but Peter and John answered and said to them, so what's their answer? Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. W what do you think? How you doing? You know, kind of one of those. Um, 
Like, really? You're going to tell us to stop speaking a name. So should we listen to you or to God? You judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. And you keep reading, and these guys get arrested. Acts chapter 5. Um, for the sake of time, we'll go down to the bottom of this verse. Uh, they're in jail. They're in jail, verse 19. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, and, and the angel's giving them directions now, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. Don't back down. So now they got arrested and they're like, okay, we're back at it. In the temple where they were told not to go. And when they had heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with them came and called the council together with all the elders and the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Like, we have no idea how they got out. Now when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So one came and told them, saying, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. They're out there again. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, and they feared the people lest they should be stoned. So now they're worried the people are going to stone the, the religious l rulers. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Now, did we not tell you? Like, let's go back over this. Did we not strictly command you not to teach in his name? Wouldn't even say Jesus. Not to teach in his name. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your, with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostle answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Now, is that your decision? You say, yeah, and so I'm going to riot and I'm going to protest and I'm going I'm to break the law and get myself arrested. That is not what this is talking about. You can do that. The context of these stories is preaching Jesus. You say, well, I'm not crazy. I'm not going to get out in a temple somewhere out on the street. Interesting how we make fun of the street preachers. Oh, look at that crazy guy out there. He's out there on that corner. Repent! Holding his Bible up. Oh, man, you're crazy. No crazier than some Old Testament prophet. Or these guys. Verse 30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things and so also is, is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Then one of the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in respect by all the people and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. Now remember, they're furious. And he said to them, men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. You better think about what you're about to do. For some time ago, Thutis arose, rose up claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this, man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. Nothing came of it. And now I say to you, keep away from these men. Now why? And let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men... It will come to nothing, but if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. Now, let me tell you something about what we're doing. 
This is not just some movement where a few hundred people. This has been going on for 2,000 years and moving forward. And what they discovered pretty quick is that if they fought Christianity, they were fighting against God. And they agreed with him. Now, this is really weird. You think, well, how is this going to go with what they just decided? They agreed with him, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, let's just throw that in there for good measure. They commanded they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now, you say, well, I'm not getting beaten for anything. You're already beat. You say, what does that mean? So if, if you just became a Christian, so let me be gentle with this. If you just became a Christian Tuesday or something, okay. It's going to take some time to get you up and running. But I'm speaking to people who have been, you say you got saved 20, 30, 40 years ago. And we couldn't find anybody in your circle of family, friends, anywhere who would even say that was what, who you are. Something is not working. Because if you get Jesus and he moves in and he takes over and he is Lord and Savior and he begins to change you from the inside out, then your life is going to be mobilized in a world. You're going to be salt. You're going to be light. You're going to change the world. It's not possible. And you will get to the place where if you say, I'm going to speak in Jesus' name, and they say, if you do, we'll beat you, that somewhere in the mix you say, then you're going to have to beat me because I will not be silent. But if you've never been anything but silent, the thought of being beaten for that is totally bizarre. You can't even get caught being a Christian, much less be beaten for speaking his name. Now, you say, well, what's the point of all this? You got to step this up, people. What are you doing here? Well, I'm doing what I think I'm supposed to do. I paid my taxes and I gave some money to the church and... I waved at an old lady in the grocery store. She waved back. Right? My evangelism verse. Follow me. I'll make you to become fishers of men. I'm not buying it. When I meet someone and they say they're a follower of Christ, I want to hear some fishing stories. Tell me what you got. Show me your fish. That's exciting conversation. And you say, well, why do you keep telling stories about leading people to Christ? Are you just bragging? No, I'm trying to bait you into going fishing. You, got, you are the bait. Go fish. Give a reason for the hope that's within you. And once you get going, you're like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. Where were we? How many verses? What verse were we on? Oh, they beat them. That's where we were. They beat them. So they beat them. Let them go. And then look at the next verse. So they departed from the presence of the council. What? Oh, my gosh. We got beat. Or beaten. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Like, this is the stuff. You think these people are nuts? No, they're not nuts. They get it. The world is going to hate you. They're going to hate me. I know there are people that unlike and, you know, he's nuts and they're not going to listen anymore. That's okay. I don't have to answer for that. I got to answer for not backing down, speaking the truth in love, and so do you. And I promise you, today, the next day, the next day, every day of your life that you're on this planet, if you at least leave your home or or talk to someone, tech, whatever, you are going to have an opportunity to give a reason for the hope that's within you. You have to seize the opportunities. You say, well, how do I know when that's happening? If you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. If he lives inside of you, you're communicating with him. If you're communicating with you, he, he will literally, without an audible voice with me, Speak to that person. 
Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. How many people have had that experience? Please raise your hand. Okay, so this is not just me. You say, well, I'm nervous. Okay, it's okay to be nervous. How, is anybody in here, non-medical personnel, ever delivered a baby outside of a hospital? Raise your hand. Nobody. You see it in the movies. Back of a cab. Okay, second question. If you were on a bus somewhere and a woman is having a baby, would you try to assist her if you were the only person around to deliver that child not knowing a thing about what you were doing, but you would still try to say, let me try to help you raise your hand? You're up. When a person becomes a Christian, they're being born again. And you say, well, I got to get them to somebody who knows how to do this. There is nobody. Sometimes there's nobody but you. And if you can already see the head, you can get the rest out. There we go. So, a little personal experience. Okay. So, anyway. <laughs> you say, well, I'm afraid I'm going to get it wrong. When a baby's coming, they're coming. Right? Just, just, I'm, I'm just almost, I'm borderline begging you, get in the game, get in the war. These people are everywhere and they can't figure out why no one's talking to me. Suicides, depression, they got no answers. You can only have sex with so many people. You can only drink, do so many drugs. You can only drink so much alcohol. You can only buy so much crap. You know, you you just, there's only so much. And then they go, oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. I've run all these traps and I'm trapped. Now what do I do? And someone walks along and the Holy Spirit says, hey, talk to that guy. Hey, how are you doing? Do you mind if I pray for you? And they're a little freaked out. And you pray for them and they start crying and what's going on and can't believe you showed up. I've been asking God to send me help forever. Nobody showed up. You showed up. Let's see. I got more notes. I might be hungry, so we might just shut it down. <laughs> okay, so sometime on your own time, go read Romans 13. And just everything after that. So... Um, All right, so here's my last point. You either get right or you get left. You say, well, how do I get right? You got to get right with him first. How do I get right with him? You say, God, I got no more excuses. Let me tell you one of the most powerful things in the world that anybody can ever do, any addiction, any anything, Take responsibility. Stop blaming everybody else on the planet for your problems, and God included. Stop blaming. They tried it in the garden. It does not work. Take responsibility. So you say, God, I take responsibility. I am a sinner, period. No excuses. And I don't want to live this way anymore, and I don't want to die this way. I understand now that you love me that Jesus died on a cross, was buried and raised from the dead to offer me the forgiveness of my sins and eternal life with you forever. I'm in. If it's a gift, I'm going to do like I do at Christmas and I'm going to say thank you very much and accept. So come live in me, come live through me, change me. I'm yours. And, and what do I always tell you? It can't be that easy. And the answer is easy for who? It's easy for us because he made everything simple. He's the one that did the dying. He's the one that suffered. He's the one that took your place. And he makes it available and even gives you the faith to believe. You don't even have to come up with the faith. So I encourage you, if you don't know him, I'm going to pray that simple prayer in just a second. 
And you can literally go from having God everywhere in the universe and in, in eternity and in heaven to moving into your physical body, and that will change everything. Father, I thank you so much for your word, um, for leaving us here on the planet to have an impact. Sure, we have the right to vote. Sure, we can have an impact on social things, but ultimately, nothing's going to change this world but Jesus. And that's hearts changing, lives changing, and then those individuals making up a nation, a society, bringing about change. Help us be very careful not to be just slinging our will and our passion and our anger and our ideals and to run it by you and ask you what you would have us do and choose accordingly. Father, for anyone out there in this room who knows for a fact if they drop dead right now, they would not end up in heaven and they know that's got to change and they would say what I just said a minute ago. God, I know that I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died on that cross, shed his blood, was buried and raised from the dead to pay for my sin and offer me the forgiveness of my sin and purchase a place for me in heaven that is all of this is a free gift. I accept, I say thank you, I receive it, and I have no way to pay for it, and I'm not even gonna try. I just thank you. Thank you that you've now moved into me in the person of the Holy Spirit. You live in me, you can live through me, change me, send people to help me grow and chase you and be bold and be the salt and light, the, the preservative, the in this dark world, Lord, the light in this world that you intended and use my life to bring about change in the lives of others and most of all, Lord, to bring glory to you that whatever they see in me, they, it would cause them to glorify you, my Father. Thank you for loving me, for coming after me, staying after me, and for this moment when I'm adopted, born into your family. And Father, for believers today, I know this is all intense and it's not about beating people down, but it is about growing up, Lord. And I pray for anybody who's just been kind of stuck. Maybe there's some sin. We all got stuff. Maybe they just, the, the enemy's got them trapped in some sin and they, they won't yield. I pray that we would confess our sins, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us, and that we would get on with the life, the only life we're ever going to have down here and live the way you intended for us to live. Be the people you want us to be. And stop hating on people because they disagree. And take a stand on things that really matter. In the sweet, precious name of Jesus. So you're the best. Thank you for being so patient with us, Lord. And for moving us along, herding us along. And uh, growing us up. And for those that have been saved today, we thank you for them. And pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I made mention uh, earlier uh, of a website, um, the reunionchurch.org, a lot of information there. But if, if you became a Christian today, whether you're in the room or out there, please just send us a little email, reunion at reunionchurch.org. Just put in there, I prayed. I know something changed. I know we moved in. And let us encourage you. We're not going to come pound on your door, harass you, send you a bunch of stuff. We just want to help. Because being born is an event. Growing is a process. And it's a long journey. Um, and, and you're going to need some help. So we'd like to be a part of that. So that's one thing. The other thing is, um, if you're in the room, we have receptacles in the back for our offering. We don't pass baskets. Um, and if you're at home, we're here, and you want to, you know, contribute, give in some way, then you go to reunionchurch.org. There's a tab on there where you can give, contribute, and it's pretty simple. Um, we do take cash, but only hundreds. So, oh, thank you for that. Thank you for that. So. Kenny, he's with me today. He's with me today. No. <laughs> yeah, we're all about the money around here, clearly. So, yeah. Anyhow, so we appreciate everybody's faithfulness on that. Um, yeah, so before we sing the last one, let me say this. I encourage everybody to vote. 
but I encourage you to speak of Jesus more than anything. Because he's not trying to get elected. He is the king. He is the king. So everybody's looking for a leader. We got one. Let's follow him. All right. Love you guys. Have a great day, a good week. Let's stand up and we'll sing our way out of here. And uh, God bless you guys.